Uh, please be seated and get yourself bundled up there. And I want to say uh, how thankful I am that we're part of a church that's in a community of churches that love each other. Because this morning, uh, our worship director, Cole, um, said my foot, his foot kept feeling worse and worse and worse. And he went to a doctor and the doctor said, uh, I know why it's feeling worse and worse. It's broken. And so, um, and so he was planning on coming and leading and, and finally realized after he got it in a, in a you know, kind of a soft cast, he wasn't going to be able to do it. And so Jedi here, thank, can we thank Jedi for leading us to worship today? Um, <clears throat> and he'll be back to lead in our closing time of worship. So Jedi was called. What time, Jedi? What time did you get the call today? 10.30. 30 this morning. Uh, Jedi is a, the worship leader over at Monterey Church, a partner church with us. And the pastor's group I'm part of uh, is with the pastor of Cypress Church and Monterey Church and different churches around the area here. But, but one of uh, our partner churches, Cole called him because he's a brother. They, they love each other. They trust each other. They said, hey, any chance you want to come and lead us in worship? And Jedi said, man, I'm there. Let's do it. And so thank you. We're, we're so thankful for being part of the, the church, not just Shoreline Church, the church, the church of Jesus. Well, this whole year... We're asking the question on nights of worship, what's in a name? What's in a name? We're looking at the names of God. And each, each month we take another name of God. And I hope that through the month you're praying that name and learning that name and, and understanding the greatness of who God is through that name. But I was thinking about what's in a name. And I was thinking about in my own family, <clears throat> some people have sort of family names, names that kind of run through a family. And we have a family name in my family that four people have the same name. And that name is Elizabeth. Elizabeth. But here's the funny thing about it. None of them go by Elizabeth. And none of them go by the same name. So what's in a name? What could be in a name is more names. In the name Elizabeth. My dad's mom, everyone either called Granny or Betty. So she's Elizabeth, but she goes by Betty. Her daughter, Elizabeth, goes by Betsy. My parents had a daughter who they named Elizabeth, and she goes by Lisa. And my sister Lisa had a little girl who she named Elizabeth who goes by Elise. So you've got in our family, Betty, Betsy, Lisa, Elise, and they're all Elizabeth. But none of them use the name Elizabeth. What's in a name? Well, maybe lots of other names. But when it comes to God, what's in a name is his character, his being, who he is. So in January, we talked about how our God is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. He is expansive over all things. That's our God. When you worship that God, when you pray to that God, when you speak to that God, understand that he is the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. And then in February, we talked about God is the advocate, the comforter, the Holy Spirit. That we can pray, Spirit of the living God, our comforter, our advocate. That he's with us, he dwells in us. His name teaches us about his character and who he is. And today... In March of 2021, we're talking about God's name as I am. Yahweh, the God of Israel, said, my name is I am. And Jesus said the same. Yahweh used the name I am, and Jesus used the name I am. And we're going to talk tonight about the trouble that caused. So if you have your Bibles with you, I'd invite you to open to Exodus chapter 3, mark that Exodus 3, and then go to John chapter 8 and mark John chapter 8. If you're using a, an iPad or a, your phone and your Bible on your phone, just you know, kind of bookmark it or get open to Exodus chapter 3. And before I begin reading in verse 12, I want to give you a little bit of context. There's a guy named Moses, and Moses is uh, born as an Israelite, but he's born in a time where the, 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 the affair was actually getting rid of uh, baby boys, his, his mother puts them out to kind of float in the, in the reeds of, of the sea, and then Pharaoh's daughter finds him, adopts him, he's raised in the palace. But there's a point at which he sees one of his own people being oppressed, he responds very violently, and has to run for his life. So now he's gone to the area of Midian, he's been away from Egypt for almost 40 years, and we know he's been gone for 40 years, not because it says so in Exodus, but because it says so in Acts chapter 7. But we find out that he's 40 years in Midian, and then one day he sees, he's out, he's tending sheep, he's a shepherd, and he sees this bush, and it's burning and burning and burning. And that's a strange thing, just a bush all by itself burning, but the really strange thing was that it kept burning and burning and burning, but it didn't stop burning. It didn't get consumed. It didn't get burned up. It just kept burning and burning and burning. Theologians call that a theophany, a theophany. That's a, a, a manifestation of God's presence through a physical thing, through fire. So in this theophany, this burning bush, Moses comes near. 
And God says, take off your shoes. You're on holy ground. And he has this conversation with the living God. And in this conversation, basically God says to him, Moses, I know it's been 40 years, but you're going to go back to Egypt. You go back to that place where they, where, where, they were, where they kind of chased you out, where you were afraid for your life, and you're going to deliver my people out of captivity, out of slavery, out of oppression, and all my people are going to leave Egypt and come into this promised land, come, come, come into the region that you're living in right now. And so here's the conversation in verse 12. And God said, he's talking, God's talking to Moses, and God said, I will be with you. And this will be a sign to you that it is I who have sent you. I love this. I want you to try to get your head around this. God says, this will be a sign to you that I'm the one who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. So he's, God says to Moses, Moses, you're going to go back to Egypt, deliver all the people, and bring them back. And Moses is thinking, how do I know this is going to work? How do I know that God's with me? How this is going to happen? And God says, well, I'll, I'll tell you how you'll know. You'll know that I was leading you. Follow this now. When you've gone back to Egypt... When the people have been set free, when you've left Egypt, you've crossed the Red Sea, you've come to the desert, and you're back on this mountain with all the people, then you'll know it was me talking to you. Doesn't that seem a little unfair? <laughs> it's like, give me a sign now, something now. God said, no, you'll, you'll know it was me when it's all done. Go back and read that sometime. It's pretty interesting. But God says, you'll know it when you're right here on this mountain worshiping. Then, you, then you'll, oh, it was God leading. Look at verse 13. Moses said to God, Suppose I go to the Israelites and, and I say to them, the God of your father has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? So Moses says, if I go there, and they say, okay, what, give us the name of God. So this is a big moment right here. This is a big moment. God's going to give his name to his people. All right? They've called him Yahweh, but they're, they're, they're saying, but what, what is your name? Look at verse 14. God said to Moses, I am who I am. I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. Moses, you tell them, his name is I am. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of, their, uh, of, of their, the patriarchs of their forefathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever. The name you shall call me from generation to generation. He is the great I am, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God who doesn't change. That's his name. Now, we all have moments in our lives that are those unforgettable moments that get seared in your memory and seared in your heart and you can never get rid of them. This was one of the moments for the people of Israel because in the history of Israel, the high point of all of Israel's history was the exodus when they left captivity and came out into freedom, into the promised land. That was the high point. You know where it all began? Right here. This is where it started. When God said to Moses, you're going to go and deliver the people. So every Israelite child knew this passage. They all knew this moment. There are moments that you cannot ever Make go away from your mind. I was thinking about that in my own life. What are moments I will never forget? Here's one of them. The first time I drove a car on a freeway. I will never forget it. Back then they had, back then they had classes in high school for driver's ed. And so I remember driving down Magnolia Street towards the 405, Orange County 405, always crowded, always busy. 10 and 2, checking my blind spot, driving for the first time. You know, one-handed, arm over the back, kind of, no, no, not like this, right? Carefully. So we go, he says, okay, now go. You're going to signal right, and you're going to go on to the on-ramp to the 405, and you're going to merge. That was my big lesson that day, merging. First time I'm driving. And so going there, and I'm going, okay, 10 and 2, signal, check the mirror, check the side mirror, blind spot slowly, cars are coming, merge. I'll never forget it. That's a moment in my life. It's, it's stuck there. It's going to be there. my first kiss. I'll never forget it. It was on my wedding day. Okay. That's a bad example. Um, my best kiss was on my wedding day. How about that? We'll go with that. But there's things you never forget. I'll give you one more as I was thinking about this. The first time I swaddled one of our boys, our firstborn son, Zach, he was so tiny. 
He wasn't small as a baby, but babies are small. And I remember in our little apartment in, on Mentor Avenue in Pasadena and laying out this blanket and laying them on it and taking the, the thing and kind of wrapping it around and tucking the, this part of the blanket and taking this one and oh, no, taking the feet part, wrapping it up here. This, and it was like a little baby burrito. I was very good at it because I know how to make a burrito. So I kind of like all wrapped up and this teeny little baby and then carefully putting him in Sherry's arms. I'll never forget it. The people of Israel would never forget this moment. What is his name? I am. I am. Thank you. What is his name? The kids are joining in first. The adults aren't sure if they're allowed to talk. What is his name? I am. He says, I am the I am. Tell them I am has sent me to you. Remember this moment. Because Jesus is going to take them back to the same moment. And we'll look at that passage in John 8 in, a, in just a few minutes. But Jesus is going to take them back to this moment. And everyone knew this moment. What is the name of Yahweh, God Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, the Lord over all? His name is I am, all right? And so, so what does that name mean? Y y y Yahweh gave this name of himself. This is God's self-designated name. What does it mean? I think two things. One, it is a name of transcendence. He is saying, I am over all and above all. When God says, I am, he says, I am the God who is over all. It is transcendence. It is glory. It is power. He is God over all. When you pray to God as the great I am, understand he is the sovereign God of the universe and beyond and everything is under his control. That's what it means. But when you pray to the God who is I am, it is also a name of imminence, of intimacy. He says, I am with you and I am near you and I am always close by. God says, I am your closest friend. I am with you every moment, all the time. I am present and tender and loving and engaged. God is transcendent. God is imminent and intimate. And both are true. And both are captured and wrapped up in this name, I am. And so here's a question. How can we experience God as both transcendent and imminent? And the best way you experience God as the glorious God who is with us is in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ came as the all-powerful, transcendent God who came and walked among us. The incarnation is the perfect picture of God's glory and intimacy all wrapped together. So now turn with me to John chapter 8. And in John chapter 8, we'll begin in verse 52. This is such a fascinating passage. If you have been told that Jesus was always gentle and always diplomatic and always sweet, kind Jesus who never kind of rubbed anybody the wrong way, you haven't read John chapter 8. Because he's interacting with the religious leaders. And they say, Yahweh, God is our Father. And they're having this discussion with Jesus about who the Father is and who knows God and who doesn't know God. And when you read it even before this, it's already getting pretty, um, it's getting pretty hot. It's getting pretty intense. So they're upset about something Jesus has said. So we're going to pick it up in verse 52. Now, how do I know that they're upset about something Jesus has just said? Go, go back later and read the whole passage. How do I know they're upset about what Jesus just said? Because in verse 52, this is how they respond. At this they exclaimed, now we know that you are demon-possessed. Okay, when someone calls you demon-possessed, they're probably upset with you. Everybody following? Everybody got that, right? So they, they say, and they exclaimed, now we know you're demon-possessed. They said, Abraham died, and so did the prophets. Yet you say that whoever obeys your word, you, Jesus, you say that whoever obeys your word will never taste death. Jesus said, if you follow my word, you'll never taste death. And they say, well, Abraham died, and the prophets died. And you say whoever obeys your word will never taste death. And then the question, verse 53, are you greater than our father Abraham? He died, and so did the prophets. Who do you think you are? Everybody following this? Who are you? Remember what Moses asked Yahweh at the burning bush? Who should I say sent me? And they say, they say, who do you think you are? But now the conversation gets a little bit sassier, okay? A little more intense. All right, who do you think you are? Verse 54, Jesus replied, if I glorify myself, 
my glory means nothing. But my, my Father, whom you claim as your God. Now, he doesn't say who is your God. He says who you claim is your God. There's, 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 there's some tension here, right? My Father, whom you claim as your God, is the one who glorifies me. Yahweh, God, glorifies me, Jesus says. Though you do not know him, I know him. He, Jesus says to them, the God that you say you worship, you don't even know him, but I do. Anybody picking up some intensity in this conversation? It's not a friendly little gentle Jesus conversation. He's trying to dig into the truth because he wants them to know him. He wants them to meet God, and they're doing religion, but they've missed the living God in the, along the way. He's trying to wake them up to that truth. Though you do not know him, I know him. If I, and then Jesus says this. If I said I did not, if I did, said I did not know God, if I said I did not, I would be a liar like you. Friendly words? I mean, Jesus, I would be, if I, I'd be a liar like you. But I do know him, and I obey his word. And then Jesus says this. Your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. And he saw it and was glad. Now, Abraham lived centuries before. And Jesus is saying to them, Abraham was delighting and waiting to see my day. And he saw my day. Wait a minute. How, how does that work? Jesus, well, they, they respond, verse 57. You are not yet 50 years old. He's just 30. So you're not even 50, they said to him. And you've seen Abraham? And they're implying, and Abraham has seen you? They're saying, you're, you're out of your mind. Now listen to verse 58. Very truly, I tell you, Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, I am. Before Abraham was born, Jesus says, I am. He takes the exact same name that Yahweh, the God of heaven and earth, gave to Moses in Exodus chapter 3, a moment that no one in Israel would ever forget, and every next generation would be told about that moment. And he says, you know the name that Yahweh gave? He says, he says I am. Now, if you're a devout Jew and you believe Jesus is lying, how do you respond? Let me finish the passage. The passage says in verse 59, at this they picked up stones to kill him, to stone him, to execute him. But Jesus hid himself, slipping away from the temple grounds. Why did they want to kill him? Because they knew exactly what he was saying. They knew Exodus chapter 3. They knew the name of Yahweh. And so, a, couple, a question and a couple of observations. What is Jesus doing when he takes the divine name on himself? What is Jesus doing in this moment when he takes the divine name of Yahweh and brings it to himself? He's saying, Jesus is saying, I'm fully divine. Jesus is saying, I am fully God. Jesus is saying, I am Yahweh. That's quite a bold statement. This is why they wanted to kill him, because they wouldn't believe it. They wouldn't accept it. But Jesus is being absolutely clear. I am divine. I am Yahweh. He's basically saying, God is sitting in front of you right now. Jesus is saying, the guy you're looking at right now, I am Yahweh, God Almighty. At other times, Jesus said, I and the Father are one. If you've, seen the, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Jesus, this is a theme through Jesus' teaching. He's being absolutely clear who he is. He says, I am the I am. And they knew exactly what Jesus was declaring. And that's why they wanted to get rid of him. Remember these two chapters of the Bible. Exodus chapter 3, Moses in the, in, in, the, in the wilderness, burning bush. Who should I say sent me? Tell, I am the I am. Tell them I am has sent me to you. John 8, 58. I am. Truly, truly, I tell you, before Abraham was born, I am. The transcendent, glorious, sovereign God. The imminent, present, loving Savior. Wrapped up into one person. What's in a name? What's in the name I am? Two things that you should take with you as you pray, as you worship, as you walk through your days. Here's the first. That God Almighty, Jesus, who is with you, the Spirit who dwells in you. We believe in one God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. God is big enough to provide, protect, and lead you. The sovereign, glorious, transcendent God can take care of whatever you're going through. Where you need protection, Go to him and cry out to him. He is the I am. Where you need provision, 
Work hard, do your part, but run to him and trust in him because he is the great I am. When you need leading and direction in your life, go to him and ask him. He is the great I am. But also in this name, when you pray, when you worship, when you talk with Jesus, when you walk with Jesus, understand that God is close enough to love, care, and speak to you. Yes, he's glorious and sovereign and over all the universe. But by his spirit, he comes to live inside of you. And he never leaves you. And he will never forsake you. And where you need tender care, you say, God, wrap your arms around me today. Because if I don't have you uphold me and give me strength, I'm not making it through this day. And God doesn't say, oh, no, 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 I'm the transcendent God running the universe. He says, I am the one who is right here with you. I am with you. Where you, where you feel weary and tired, say, God, lift me up. Where you feel lonely, say, God, could you be so near me that I know you are my closest friend? He is that close. He is that tender. He is that intimate. The God that we gather to worship, the Jesus who gave his life on the cross, whose body was broken and whose blood was shed. He is the great I am. From Exodus to the Gospels to your life today. Oh God, this is our prayer. That we would experience you as the great I am. That we would know that you are with us and you are near us and you love us. God, remind us in the moments where it looks like the world is falling apart, apart and everything has gone crazy and we feel like there's just, just things just seem so out of sorts. Remind us that you are on the throne of glory. You rule and reign in heaven. You are sovereign and powerful and you are the great I am over all things. But Lord, when we need your tenderness and your closeness and a sense of your presence, would you remind us that you are the great I am. You are with us. You, you can say, God, God, you tell us, I am with you now, in this moment, and the next moment, and the next moment. There's never a moment you leave us alone. Jesus, as we come to the table now, as we break the bread, as we drink the cup, as we share together in this gift of communion, we come into the presence of the great I am. Jesus Christ, our Savior. Just keep your heart in a place of prayer. And if you're at home and you uh, have not got some juice and crackers or bread and wine, whatever you're going to use, I encourage you to just go get those elements right now and bring them over to where you're gathering with uh, family or friends or by yourself. And here in the courtyard, you should have gotten a little cup that when you came in, if you didn't, would you raise your hand really high? And we have teams with baskets. They're going to get to you and bring you this little cup. And what, what's going to happen? I'm going to ask you, to, it's going to be tough. Take your gloves off for a minute if you can because you've got to peel off one little layer of plastic and there's a wafer and hold that wafer. Then peel off the second layer. It's kind of like a puzzle, but I believe in you. You can do this. We're gonna, you're going to earn your communion tonight, okay? <laughs> but peel off the top layer, get the wafer, peel off the second layer and hold the cup and don't squeeze it too tight. Just hold the wafer in one hand, the cup in the other as we partake in communion together. So as you're getting the elements ready at home, in your cars over here, again, someone will come by there. You can raise your hand if you didn't get elements. As you're getting things ready here in the courtyard, listen to these words from Isaiah chapter 53, prophesied 500 years before Jesus came and walked on this earth. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. And the punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. I invite you to listen to these words of provision and hope. Luke chapter 22. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and he said, Take this and divide it among you. 
For I tell you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and he gave it to them, saying, This is my body given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. As you hold the elements in your hands, as you hold Jesus in your heart, and as you recognize that as the great I am, he holds your life in his hands. Think of these truths. We come to communion because Jesus wants us to. Jesus instituted this. He said, do this in remembrance of me. We don't come to the table of the Lord to declare we're perfect. We're come because we know we're not. We need the grace of Jesus, and these elements remind us of his grace and his love for us. We come to the table because we're a family. So whether we're in our cars or in our, in our homes alone or with others or in the courtyard, we are part of God's family spread all over the world and throughout all time. We're not alone. So I want to invite you, if you're from another Christian fellowship, but you are a Bible-believing, Jesus-loving follower of his, this is his table, not the table of, of Shoreline Church. And so we welcome you to partake. And if you're not yet a follower of Jesus, we are so glad you're with us, whether you're on the campus or online, we're glad you're with us. But this will be something to kind of hold off on doing and not partake in because you don't really understand what it means yet. But if you want to talk with any of our pastors or if you're here with a friend and want to say, you know, tell me after the service what this is all about, this whole communion thing, we'd love to talk to you about it because this is so precious to us. But if you're a believer in Jesus, we invite you to join with us. And finally, we come to this table as a reminder of amazing grace. There are few better pictures of grace than the bread and the cup. Reminders of his body. Reminders of his blood shed for us. So prepare your heart as we come to the table. This bread reminds us of the body of our Lord Jesus Christ. The great I am, the one who declared he was I am, is I am, also said, I am the bread of life. Sustenance. Fully adequate for all that we need. In fact, his declaration that this bread is fully sufficient for all that you desire and need. So I ask that you would prepare to receive this as we do this together, remembering the great I am, the bread of life. This is remembrance of his great provision. Let us partake together. this cup reminds us of the blood of Jesus Christ shed for the forgiveness of our sins. Jesus said, every time you do this, do it in remembrance of me. When we partake of this cup, we remember that by his wounds, we are healed. We remember that the book of Hebrews says, Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. We remember that while Jesus hung on the cross, dying, he knew our name. He knew your name. All your sins. And he loves you anyways. As we partake, we remember the price Jesus paid to win us back and to call us his children. Let's partake of this cup together.
Heavenly Father, great I am, Alpha and Omega, Comforter, Bread of Life. Lord, we've participated in this cup and this bread together in grand remembrance of your even grander gift for each of us. May that remembrance cause us to turn to you again and again and again for full satisfaction. For bread that never dissipates. For the blood of cleansing for our souls. For life for all eternity. In your remembrance that we do these things together this evening, out of great gratitude and appreciation. Father, thank you for your, your love for us. Amen and amen. Amen.